Jeff Harding, welcome back to the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate you having me. And for anybody who doesn't know, Jeff was here previously with his uh, good friend and partner to uh, talk about the weather during the Battle of Gettysburg. And among other things, you guys coined the use of the phrase wet bulb during the Battle of Gettysburg. So <laughs> if anybody hasn't listened to that one, they really need to check that out. Yeah, for sure. We got more terms coming for you in the, in the book, Jim, when, <laughs> when that book comes out. Stand by. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what's the status on the weather book? When's that one coming out? Uh, we're looking at spring 2025. So okay, great. We're, uh, we're staring down the barrel of getting it done. Uh, really first half of this year, getting it over to the publisher. Be out we with History uh, Press. Do we have a title yet? Uh, we do not have a title yet. Uh, we've got a couple. We're going back and forth a little bit on that. So uh, we'll keep right. you posted. But Wet ball at Gettysburg? Wet ball at Gettysburg. It's the whole campaign, though. June 3rd <laughs> through July 15th. Okay, so, good. Uh, we've, we've got some new things for people, uh, some some uh, data no one's ever known about. I think pretty excited about it. So, Yeah, well, you should be. Okay, well, when that one comes on, we'll have to have you back here then for a third time. But tonight, we're going to talk about your book on uh, John Reynolds and his relationship with uh, Catherine Kate Hewitt. Uh, Jeff, like myself, is a licensed battlefield guy to Gettysburg. Mo any good battlefield guide worth their salt knows the human interest aspects of the Reynolds and Kate story. But before we get into that, Jeff, you want to just tell us how did you particularly get interested into the story enough to kind of dive into the research and then do a book about it? Yeah. How about that? Um, you know, Jim was actually accidental. Um, like you, uh, certainly appreciate the stories. I tell people all the time and you think about uh, the Gettysburg Address and, and Lincoln's speech. And one of my favorite lines is, the world will little note or long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And the irony is, you know, we remembered Lincoln's words, but what do we get? A million and a half, two million people a year coming back to Gettysburg to find out what they did here. And it's like, well, how come people aren't remembering this? And I think so many times you, if you overload them with facts, and as guides, we know this, right? You can't give them too much. Uh, you've got to have some stories in there to help people remember. So, you know, you pull away from the visitor center and you're heading out to the first day's battlefield and you could touch on a few stories. Jenny Wade, for, for me, I'm talking about Jacobs and the weather a little. But boy, when you get to stop number one, you get to sink your teeth into it because uh, that's where Reynolds, of course, met his demise. And, uh, and when I tell the story about Reynolds and what's happened with the first day, I always would bring Kate Hewitt into the story. So I always had an interest in it, um, but it was an open ended story. Uh, bothered me some, but mm -hmm. told what I did know, and, and that was that. But uh, as COVID entered all our worlds a few years ago, I happened to be working uh, on an effort to uh, a book I've been messing around with, for lack of a better term, for a number of years, Navy Connections to the Battle. I published okay. an article in Naval History Magazine on this, but I'd like to turn it into a book. So I'm digging into William Reynolds. Now, that's John's brother. And arguably the most famous Reynolds brother at uh, before Reynolds was killed at Gettysburg is his brother, William. He's on a uh, famous uh, expedition. It's called the uh, U.S. Exploring Expedition. This is 1838, 1842 time frame. Most people know it as the Wilkes Expedition. Uh, this is where William Reynolds is one of the first human beings ever from the United States to lay eyes on what we know today as Antarctica. He also discovers an island that later is going to be called Midway and claims it for the United States. So he's significant in the Civil War. He's uh, in a blockading squadron, what have you. So I'm, I'm doing something on its connection to the battle. You got John Reynolds, you got William Reynolds. And I said, you know, I'll say something about John in here, of course, and maybe I'll throw a little sidebar in here on the, on the John and Kate story. And so I start looking around a little bit, digging into it. And oh my gosh, the more I look, Jim, the more I realized it's the wild, wild west out there with the mm -hmm. internet anymore. You know, I mean, um, really, if you go back to um, the late uh, 1950s, Edward Nichols, landmark biography on John Reynolds, he introduces the story, uh, but he barely touches on it. And then a young lady named Mary Maloney, 1961, she published an article in the Lancaster, uh, Langster, excuse me for you, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, they'll catch you on that, yeah. <laughs> Historical Society. Now, she was a student at St. Joseph's over in Emmitsburg. She was a senior at the time, but she wrote a very well-written, uh, informative article all about the story. 
And she really put it on the map for my money. And it was published far and wide after that, a uh, number of places, journals, newspapers, et cetera, American Heritage. Um, and then it kind of laid there for years and years and years. But then Wayne Motts, our colleague, and um, of course, a guy that to me um, knows more uh, about rentals, really. I mean, I know you know a ton. I know stuff. We have colleagues. But I got to tell you, Mike Riley, I don't know if you know Mike. I do. Yeah. Mike, you know, Mike yeah. listens to the show. Uh, well, Mike is so brilliant. I mean, I can call it Mike and we'll be talking about any number of things and I'll bring up some about Reynolds. And he's quoting from a letter that Reynolds wrote about visiting his cousin in Frederick just prior to the battle. And he knows wow. exactly what Reynolds had to eat there. You know, because he mentioned it in the letter. And I was just like, oh, Mike, you got a steel trap for mine. Anyway, Mike and Wayne are doing the research for Dale Gowan, 1996, 97 time frame. Because Dale painted a beautiful painting, Last Promise. It's mm -hmm. a scene where yeah. Reynolds and Katie Hood are being engaged. So uh, it starts to get life again. And then there are others that begin to wade in, a couple of number, uh, a, a number of folks. And so some good research out there, some interesting points of view some things leaning one way or another with the story, but again, then the internet and now it blows up and you go on if, and, and there's any number of versions. So I said, all right, it's COVID. I'm home. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to stay out of trouble. This is what my mission is for the next year or so. I got to research this, however long it takes. And the more I found out, the more I realized, okay, I got to share this story. Mm. And uh, I hadn't planned to write a book about this at all, but that's the evolution of how I got there to the point where I'm going to start uh, writing this book. Once we learned so many things that had been unknown, had been uncertain, and even, Jim, a million and one little details, like at the Daughters of Charity, uh, you'll see this story anywhere where they refer to her, she's going to be a nun. They don't yeah. refer to them as nuns with the Daughters of Charity. They refer to as sisters. Right. So it's a little thing, right? And there are big things, no doubt, and we'll talk about. But there are a lot of small things in the story that needed, my way of thinking, clarification. So, okay. So, all right. Do the book. So that's how I got into that. So I'm going to presume most listeners of the Battle of the Gettysburg podcast know the uh, the military aspect of John Reynolds at Gettysburg. So we won't spend a lot of time on that tonight. But for the sake of people listening who may not know, you know, what has always sort of been the traditional Reynolds and Kate story, you want to start with maybe a thumbnail scratch on that and just sort of yeah, sure. talk about that? Absolutely. So, you know, the story, as I would tell it, when I'm out on the battlefield with folks, is that uh, when Reynolds is killed, uh, they're going to examine his remains, you know, he's carried back to the George George house. And then uh, we'll talk about a little bit of this later, I'm sure. But ultimately, they're going to realize that, number one, his West Point ring is missing. And where in the world is it? No one knows. But it seems to be that in there, in its place is a little gold ring as an inscription in it, it says, Dear Kate. Now around his neck, and this is one of the things you read in any number of versions of what somebody described this as, but I go back to the primary source, right? What they're saying uh, was found on Reynolds and it's a silk cord around his neck with two Catholic items there, uh, a heart and a cross. Was it a sacred heart medal? Maybe, probably it's referred to as a heart. Is it a crucifix? Could be. Either way, he's Presbyterian. It's a little unusual. So his West Point ring's missing. There's a deer cake ring. And so what's going on? So the remains ultimately are taken back to one of his sister's home. She lives in Philadelphia, 1829 Spruce Street, Rittenhouse Square. And that's where the remains go. And it's like 2 o'clock in the morning on July 3rd when they receive the remains. That day, later on, July 3rd, uh, there's a knock on the door. And it's a young lady named Kate Hewitt. And she's there to begin to unfold the story for them. She wants to grieve over the remains. Yeah. And you can imagine, you know, she's going to find out about this in all likelihood from the newspaper, like the family found out. And, and oh, my gosh, she's got to make a decision. They had actually planned to announce their engagement to the family on July 8th. Very bravely goes to introduce herself. They had wondered, the family. Because they're wondering where the ring is. They're wondering what's this small gold ring. And there are a couple letters in his valise from Kate. And the wax seal on those letters is from Torsdale, which is Philadelphia in essence. Uh, and you say, okay, who's sending him a letter? Who in the world's Kate? And of course, this was Kate. Mm. So tell the story. She, she tells the family how they had met 
coming on a ship and through Panama and another ship up to uh, New York. Uh, that's where they met. That's where they fell in love, subsequently get engaged. And then she tells him that, and it, we refer to this as a promise, the way it's mm -hmm. worded in the letters, that the sisters write letters to William Reynolds. He's not there at the time. He's on duty with the Navy. But they explained to him that she had um, had John Reynolds permission to seek a religious life if he were to be killed during the war. His so there's, yeah, his permission. Isn't yeah. that something, you know? So, yeah. um, but in essence, that's the, that's a, a vow she's made to him. And so she does so. Uh, and we can get into a little later. There's some confusion or had been a when she begins. There's a letter written in early, in early July, but March 17th, 1864 is when she formally begins a process known as a seminary sister. Okay. So she's in Emmitsburg from that point. Um, and then she's later um, on a mission in Albany, New York. And the story it always had been from that point on, it's really mysterious because uh, in 1868, right before she's about to take her vows, don't call them final vows with the daughter of chair either. She's going to make vows. Just prior to that, she leaves. And for years, no one knew what happened. And a researcher, yeah. Marion Latimer, revealed in, in 2005, I believe it was, that uh, she was teaching. She was teaching in Albany. But then um, there had been a belief that she might have then left Albany and that she was really a, a Kate Hewitt from Stillwater, New York. Mm -hmm. There was some skepticism, but no one knew anything else. So, you know, what do you believe? So that's where we would leave the story. You know, we don't know for certain. Um, uh, but we do know this. There was a secret engagement. He's killed. She meets the family. She begins the process, but something happens. She leaves. And so that's the traditional story, Jim. Yeah. Okay. I know often on my tours, I'll often kind of let people guess and say, look, he was a Protestant. Why do you think there might've been an issue with them getting married? And, you know, people will raise their hands and say, oh, she was pregnant. No, uh, well, yeah. she was married. She was married. No, she was African-American. No. So you get to play a little bit of the guessing game uh, before yes. kind, of, kind, kind of coming down to it. I've even worked it to the point where I can kind of click my uh, hiking boots together to to mimic the sound of her <laughs> knocking on the sister's door. So I'm actually sure. quite, quite proud of the storytelling capabilities there. But um, yeah, oh. no, it's good. And you're right, because that's what we would leave people with. Well, you know, she's converted to Catholicism. Yeah. He's Presbyterian. Religion can still be a big issue, right? But back then, huge. And yeah. so that's why we thought, and we still don't know for sure, but we offer something else now yeah. uh, to consider. <laughs> um, but anyway, they did keep it a secret. We know that much. <laughs> okay, so, let, so then let's rewind. And now a little bit more of the real story, kind of the story behind the story. And, um, you know, maybe we'll start with how did they meet? Where was Reynolds at that point in his career, in his life? How and where did they meet? And then kind of maybe just pick it up going forward. And, of course, it goes without saying, what was she doing when they met? Sure. Yeah, exactly. So um, let's see. Well, tell you, I answer your question directly. They meet on that ship, and I alluded mm -hmm. to this earlier, uh, the Golden Age, the SS Golden Age, coming out of San Francisco. Uh, he's boarding the ship. His orders that he's received now, he's going to be commandant at West Point, okay. his alma mater. All right, so he's on his way back. General Harney's on the vessel with him, a couple other officers. Uh, he had been out west a, a couple times in his career. Uh, on the second time around, though, he's got these orders. He's coming back. Um, and that's where fate takes a hand because boarding that same vessel is Catherine Hewitt. Uh, interestingly enough, when she boards the vessel, uh, someone recognizes her, a reporter from the area, mm. uh, Sacramento B, I believe it was a newspaper. Uh, he writes about the whole voyage from A to Z, who's on the voyage, what the ship is like going to Panama, what the uh, cross isthmus transit was like, how long it took, uh, the ship coming north, which, by the way, I always love. The ship coming north is the North Star. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's certainly bringing Catherine Hewitt home. Right? It's bringing her back to New York. That's where she was from. Another little detail, right? Oigo, not Oswego. And you see that confused in some of the stories. Definitely Oigo. Uh, but uh, they, they, they meet on a ship. She is coming home. Uh, and she's coming to a new future because she's coming back in essence uh, to convert to Catholicism. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, what drives her to that? What drives her to that? So let's go a little bit further back, Jim. What's she doing in California? Yeah. You know, we know why John's out there. So Catherine Hewitt is an orphan. She tells John Reynolds' sisters she's an orphan. So we have her word on that. She tells them they met on a ship. We have her word on there. There had been some belief. Maybe they knew one another uh, previously. There is absolutely no proof that we could find on that. And before I forget it, I'm working on this project at the time with Mary Pitkin. Don't know if you recognize the name or not. Mary, I got to know her because she had an ancestor that fought with the 102nd New York over to 78th 102nd on Culp's Hill. And I'd written an article for Gettysburg Magazine a number of years ago. And it was this wonderful image of a reunion uh, on a New York State military website. And Mary Pitkin had donated. So I get in touch with Mary Pitkin. Turns out she has the ancestors. So we hit it off. Big time genealogy expert. I mean, Mary's as good as they get. So when I started on this project, I'm reaching out to her right away. So a lot of what we're digging up at the time, this is Mary and I every day back and forth. And I'll get an email from her. You know, she's found something big. Or then the biggest was bombshell, you know, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But uh, but anyway, um, just wanted to uh, share that credit always with Mary because it wasn't just Jeff doing all this research. Um, but this article written about the voyage uh, mentions that there's a woman on the voyage named Kate Winworth. Wentworth traveling as Miss Hewitt. Mm. So he recognizes this woman. Now he says, late of the Bruton affair, B R E W T O N. Okay. And this was the bombshell. Mary and I are like, what in the world? You got to be kidding. You know, so what is what's going on? So, Jim, and you know this from your research, one of the, the things that we're fortunate this day and age, the internet can be an issue, like we've discussed with uh, some some different variations of what might or might not be the truth. But boy, the tools that are out there, mm -hmm. especially the newspaper databases yeah, yeah. now, where you would have to go somewhere and dig into an archive, so much is there now. So we're pulling up these articles left and right. And sure enough, there's a number of them about the Bruton affair. And then the more you read about it, you realize that they're referring to Kate Wentworth in a line of work that you would have never expected Catherine Hewitt to be involved in. And and when you're when you're studying history and you're researching, you never know what you're going to find, right? But in this case, you're dealing with a story where Kate Hewitt, for many, have been deified. You know, this was John Reynolds' right. fiance, and so boy, when you find this out, it's kind of like, I mean, you can't <laughs> even get the hair to go down on the back of your neck. It's like, oh, this is giving me chills. But it is what it is because Kate Hewitt, orphan, trying to make something of her life, gets an opportunity to go to the West Coast to work for a governess for a very well-to-do person. Now, um, the initials that were before this, this, this guy's name originally uh, were wrong. Um, uh, Woodward, G.R. Woodward were the initials that you would see. Um, it turns out it's Robert Glenn Woodward. And there's a place in San Francisco in 1860s called Woodward Gardens. It's a mm -hmm. combination of Central Park and the Smithsonian. He's the guy behind it, right? He's the guy's name for it. But he's got a famous hotel out there. It's a temperance society and a couple kids. And one of the researchers, I believe Frank Burns was the one that, that found this. There's a ship coming out of Rhode Island with this guy's family. And it mentions they have a servant with them. Well, the servant and all I could have is Catherine Hewitt. She's going out to be a governess. We do not know what happened at that household. We don't know if something went awry. We don't know if she left on her own accord for any number of reasons. But we do know that uh, Kate Wentworth, a.k.a. Catherine Hewitt, ends up in Sacramento. And we have the census records showing where she lived and showing that the, the profession listed for her on the census records is PROS, period. Oh, OK. Yeah. And then you start to look at all the neighbors and then you start to do some research on Sacramento. Now, this is gold rush time frame, in essence. This is, you know, mid 1940s. Uh, latter part of the 1940s for Kate Hewitt out there. 18, 1840s, so, yeah. 1840s, yeah. excuse me. Thank you. And so um, she's playing her trade. Mm. She, it, it, as we look at it, she's probably a madam, if you will, of a small establishment, two or three girls perhaps working for her. Um, don't know how directly involved she was, but her involvement somehow ties her to this guy, Bruton. And when they get together, and he's <laughs> very prominent individual, 
in the town, uh, super well known politically, et cetera. And uh, he's married and has children. And there's a problem there, right? Mm-hmm. But there's a problem because he wants Kate Wentworth, Kate Huey, to leave with him, get on a ship, and he's going to leave his wife destitute without a dime. Kate Hewitt had looked like she was going to go with this program until she found that out. When she finds out he's leaving the wife destitute, and she basically rats him out. She tells the wife. Mm. She tells the wife, and she shows up at the pier when they're getting ready to go on the ship. Now, the ship they're going to board, ironically, and this is this is... 1859, it's a year before, year before she gets on the vessel with Reynolds, the Golden Age. Same ship. We see ships are, you know, routine uh, calls, sports of call and what have you, but it's ironic. Uh, So anyway, she, she, um, I think, had an epiphany of sorts at this point. Uh, She's gotten off on the wrong side of the tracks, if you will. And uh, it's time this thing shocked her into, in all likelihood, okay, I got to make a change. Mm-hmm. I'm heading back. She comes back. She converts to Catholicism. So, so a couple of the showstoppers there was the Bruton affair and what Kate had ended up doing. Wasn't that all unusual? And you talk to people that are experts on this, and I am no expert on this. I'll tell you right up front. But in general, uh, for for a single woman, that's right. In, in that day and age, there yep. weren't that many options, and she's left to earn money, and also. She's left to uh, care for uh, what they refer to as an adopted sister uh, or a ward at the time, a 10 year old. This isn't her child, but she's caring for this child. She needs the money. And what are you going to do? So she does what she has to do. And uh, she brings the 10 year old with her on the ship um, and um, back to convert to Catholicism with her at Eden Hall, Society of the Sacred Heart at Torresdale. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think you uh, you hit on something there. It's obviously we listen to that today and we think prostitute and we initially think of the moral implications and maybe some of the, you know, titillating aspects of it a little bit. But you're right in these boom towns, Western expansion. If a single woman had to make a living, there were very few options available to her. And this was one of the most popular ways to do that. So I agree. I think we definitely have to keep that in mind when we kind of judge what what Kate was doing. Um, be that as it may, do you have any indication then that Reynolds would have known any of this background or that he, she would have shared it with him? Do you have any indication of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately not. We don't yeah. know. Um, Jim, um, just touching real quick, I pulled up some really good studies, was able to locate some studies on prostitution in California and yeah. Sacramento. And, and I, I can't remember the exact figure, but I want to say, it was like close to half the women in Sacramento at that time. That was their line of work. I mean, there's plenty of money to be made out there at that time. So, but uh, as far as Reynolds knowing, no, I thought about it a lot and, you know, he meets her on the ship and I'll tell you, the woman carries herself. Well, she's very well educated. She writes a rebuttal in the newspaper in California. She does Jim. It's in the book. I quoted that thing at length because it's very powerful. And it speaks to a lot of things, but it, it's bottom line is uh, they've accused her of, of uh, you know, all these things. And she's saying, look, um, I had no options. I'm caring for a child. I'm trying to survive. And, you know, what you're accusing me of is far from the truth. Um, she writes it eloquently. So I encourage anyone that if you get the book. Make sure you read that. Take it to heart, because I think it speaks volumes about her character. And and one thing I bang home in the book many times is uh, the word perseverance. And yeah. Kate Hewitt, you know, as an orphan, you're going to struggle. She gets out there. Something doesn't go right. Now she's on her own. And yet every time she's equated to a boxer, Rocky, she knocked to the canvas. She gets up. She gets up. <laughs> Amazing. And she never stops. Really doesn't. Well, that might be the first time I've seen Kate compared to Rocky Balboa. Rocky nice job Balboa. There, right? so always the, uh, always the, the new Philly connection. connection. 
Exactly. Maybe, you know, <laughs> here on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. And I was going to make a comment about the women of Sacramento, but I was afraid I might lose whatever audience we have in Sacramento. So I won't go there either. No, um, no. There's some great, uh, great folks at the library out there, though. They were yes. up to me and do research. Yes, there are lovely people, yeah. lovely people. So, <laughs> So then what do we know about how their relationship blossoms or takes off on the voyage? How long of a trip are we talking about? How how long are they together? Yeah, that's like a three week uh, okay. sojourn, if you will. It's, um, you know, uh, down the coast. So it's plenty of time. There's plenty of time crossing the isthmus, plenty of time coming back up. And so they obviously got to know each other well at that point. Uh, they arrive in New York. He's got some time before he's due to report uh, to the military academy. So I believe they're spending some time together. Uh, we, The biggest thing that, that uh, you know, drives me nuts about this whole thing is John Reynolds and Kay Hewitt obviously writing letters to one another. He's got two in his release. Uh, the family does an amazing job of saving every letter John Reynolds, and there were many, wrote to the family, any number of the family members, large family, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's not one letter from Kate to John or vice versa extant that I can find. Oh. Haven't given up, Jim, because uh, there are branches of the family that have been amazingly kind to me. And I mention this, of course, in my acknowledgments. Um, but there are some folks out there, as I understand it, that may have things that, for whatever reason, haven't been shared. Now, yeah, is it just artifacts? Is it a gun? Is it a, a field death? What is it? I don't know, but could it be letters? I, you know, something tells me in my gut because John's uh, sister Ellie is really the one keeping many of these uh, family treasures, if you will. Um, she carries on a dialogue with Kate when Kate's with the Daughters of Charity. Uh, okay. They're writing back and forth. But when Kate and the, the other big story that comes out of the research, right, we'll talk about shortly, when she finds out ultimately what happens with Kate after she leaves the Daughters of Charity, I think um, she's maybe, conjecture, but maybe not happy with that. And at that point, maybe she destroys the letters. Maybe they're not there. Yeah, maybe. It'd be yeah. a shame. But And sometimes there are things maybe said in personal letters we don't need to read anyway. But boy, you'd like to know more about uh, John and Kate communicating, not only uh, before the war, but especially during the war. Yeah, well, you know, that's a great segue into, um, you know, what I wanted to ask you. So we get off the boat. We've spent a few weeks together on the boat. What do we know as far as additional time that they spend together? Really, let's say, take it from the time they get off the boat. I mean, literally up to, you know, July 1st at Gettysburg. What do we know about how much mm -hmm. time they spend together? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, this is probably the clunkiest chapter in the book, right? But I wanted to do this. And you start laying out spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't put that in the book. But I went through uh, really the period of the war where John had leave yeah. for any number of reasons. And he's he'll write, and, you know, I'm heading home, or there's an account of him close to D.C. when he's um, in Virginia. And he can, he's a horse, you know, get on a horse and ride in and see his brother, sister-in-law. So there are any number of instances I'll say at least a half a dozen um, where he could have visited with Kate and I can't see any reason why he wouldn't have. We believe. And I'll say we was again, I talk to Mike about this all the time. Uh, I talked to Mary about this, of course, when we we're doing the research, others as well. But Kate goes to Philadelphia to convert uh, her adopted sister, if you will, is still there at that school once Kate leaves in July of 1861. Okay. Um, I don't see any reason why Kate's going too far from there at that point. Uh, he knows that John has family in Philadelphia. Um, so he visits Philadelphia often. Is he going to visit his sisters? He even visits Meade's wife one time to send Meade's best, you know. Uh, is he not going to see Kate if she's there? That would be crazy to think. So I, I think that they're probably seeing one another. But uh, how many times exactly? And whether circumstances, again, nothing next time. So uh, you can only use logic uh, mm -hmm. to to really determine. And there's one thing that stands out with um, when the engagement might have taken place. As I tried yeah. to analyze that, uh, I'm looking at the fact that the family's got these two letters and they're sealed with John Reynolds West Point ring. And I'm banging my hand. I'm sealing here. <laughs> no <laughs> wax on my hand. No sealing. Uh, 
if she has this West Point ring while she's at uh, Eden Hall, then they must be engaged by this point, right? So the engagement to me takes place before she leaves there. And she leaves in early July of 1861. So mm-hmm. I think they're engaged at that point. Um, that's the best uh, I can come up with as far as all of that and trying to trying to um, piece these pieces of the puzzle together on the engagement. Okay. And again, maybe the most famous aspect of it, you've already touched on it in our thumbnail opening, but the promise. Let's just go into a little more detail on that. What do we... Mm-hmm. When do we think that might occur? Is that around the time of the engagement or before or after? Um, you know, what specifically does she later say about the promise? Again, just what do we know about that and maybe a little more detail? Sure. Um, I think the most important thing we know about it is what she did later. And I mean, there's a letter written from a religious representative from Eden Hall to the Daughters of Charity in early July of 1863 uh, asking about Kate becoming a seminary sister. So she's starting right away. So what prompted her to do that? This is a commitment she's made to him. Now, she does use the terms that she had his permission to enter a religious life. Um, I think that's, you know, a uh, classic uh, way of saying it from the age. She had obviously said to him, you know, if, if, if something happens to you, this is what I'm telling you I'm going to do. And of course, he's like, I mean, taken aback, I'm sure, but he's like, well, that's, I appreciate it. You know, what else is he going to say? Uh, yeah. You don't know. Uh, but uh, I'm sure he took heart from that. Um, and she meant what she said. God bless her. I mean, she begins the process and it's not an easy process. Um, you know, there's been debate about what she died of when uh, the thought was she might have been the other woman. It was pneumonia and lived into the 1890s. We know that's not her now. Uh, Kate died of consumption tuberculosis. Where did she get it? Uh, The sisters are taking care of wounded quite a bit Mm. in in a lot of places. Uh, Of course, after Gettysburg, um, she's not there at that time, but she serves a postulancy, a period of postulancy in Baltimore at a medical facility. This is what the Daughters of Charity, one of the things they do. And in all likelihood, she's around very sick people at the time. Might've been where she contracted it. So here she's making this commitment but she's placing her own health at peril. And the sisters, uh, as she writes to Ellie, uh, what have you, um, she uh, mentions, Ellie will mention this cough. Ellie, by the way, is writing in turn to Charles Vale. And you know who Vale is yeah, for the folks okay. who are listening. Don't. Right. This, is, this is the man that's with Reynolds, his orderly when he's killed. And he writes the best account, his first version of what happened, the most fresh, you know, he's right there writing about it. And um, and Vale has a, a keen interest in all things John Reynolds. He stays close with the family. They stay close with him. Kate stays close with the family. And mm-hmm. in turn, they relate to uh, Vale. Interesting side story. Jimmy, familiar with the handkerchief story. Mm-hmm. So um, the Daughters of Charity are famous. If you've never been to Emmitsburg to see uh, when they have the museum down there is wonderful, but they'll do special displays. They rotate. They recently had one on the embroidery of the sisters world class. You look at this, you can't believe that your eyes that you're seeing embroidery and it's not a painting, you know, it's just unbelievable. Well, when Kate Hewitt first ends up with the daughters of charity, she had been creating an embroidered handkerchief for John Reynolds prior to her entry there. She still has it. When Ellie and one of the other sisters go to visit her, one of John's sisters go to visit, they take Vale with them. This is their, the second time they'd come to Gettysburg. First time was November of 1863. Right. Second time we're thinking is probably March, mid-March. It's certainly after Kate's there, March 17th, uh, probably before early April. So in those last two weeks. Anyway, she gives the handkerchief she'd been creating for John to Charles Vale. Family saves it all these years. The thing survives the Johnstown floods. I'd only ever seen it in one place. But Lancaster History Journal here, Mary Maloney's article. Okay. She has a picture of it. Yeah. So I was in earnest trying to find a daggone thing, and I found a little conversation online one of these Civil War talk websites, and the guys in there mentioned, and I have the handkerchief. <laughs> what? Who are you? 
Fred Vale. Fred Vale, a descendant, is in Arizona. I'd lived in Pennsylvania, going to live in a better climate, right? But yeah, yeah. Starts starts a museum out there, Charlotte Hall. And in that museum, it, which is mostly not related to anything to do with Civil War, right? It's Native American, what have you, is the handkerchief. Is the handkerchief. Is Charles Vale's revolver. Is the gold pocket watch that the Reynolds family gives to Charles Vale. Mm. They have a number of items like that. So um, finding that thing was a thrill. Couldn't wait to get it in the book. Black and white doesn't do it any justice, but it's a white handkerchief and it's it's white embroidered. So it's wow. tough anyway yeah. if it was in color. But the detail that is in it is fabulous. So um, anyways, I don't know how I got off on that tangent now, but I <laughs> wanted to get that in there before I forgot. Because hey, embro it's Embroidery, it's folks, on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, we do it all don't we bring so. it in well it's actually <laughs> another key part of uh what tied everything up with what we know happened with kate later on when we get to that yeah That's yes it. so uh, a couple thoughts there and i get out to arizona periodically so remind me next time i'm Prescott. going out i need i need to get out to see you and you can tell me where the museum is so i can check it out so well i don't know if you're going with your wife i won't intrude but if it's just you let me know because i want to go all I right. haven't seen it in person. Oh, okay. I oh, well, I think we've got a Battle of Gettysburg road, podcast road road trip. lined up. Yeah, yeah we can up. do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So do we know when she finds out that he is killed? Yes, you know, you yeah, had, because... You mentioned yeah. earlier the likelihood that she's spending her time in and around Philadelphia anyways. do we? What do we know? Do we think she's in Philadelphia at the time when the news of Reynolds's death immediately hits and do we have anything indicating or suggesting maybe anything she wrote about just what her personal reaction might have been but, anything so uh it certainly seems she's in Philadelphia and here's why Jim I mean we all know he's killed on July 1st and the body's going to go down to Union Bridge you know they can't find a a proper uh, coffin to put him in a, a marble cutters box. They have to knock out the end. They put him in mm -hmm. a wagon. They're going to the Western terminus of the Western Maryland railroad at that time. So that's union bridge. And down there, um, there's an undertaker cabinet maker, John Fernie. And there's another individual that's with him, Hollenberger, uh, who does work for Fernie. Anyway, they fashion a, a coffin for him there, but it's amazing. You know, from there, it's on the train to Westminster and ultimately to Baltimore, where he's going to be embalmed. Same embalmer that embalmed his dad, ironically. His dad had died in Philadelphia, uh, excuse me, Baltimore, visiting one of John's sisters at the time, Jenny. Uh, but anyway, then it's up to Philadelphia. So, like I said, it's two in the morning, two in the morning on July 3rd. She's there on July 3rd. So it comes out in the papers, um, you know, early enough for her to see it. And then, you know, recover from the shock, I'm sure, to the point where she says, I need to see the remains. I've got to get some closure here. Yeah. And I think to her credit, she realizes, I need to talk to the family. I've got his West Point ring. It's not for me anymore. I'm going into the religious life. I need to return it. And this she does. So we don't have anything she wrote, Jim, about how yeah. she's feeling. Yeah. But we have very descriptive letters from two of his sisters, Ellie and Jenny, right to William. And boy, those letters are national treasures, in my way of thinking. If you read those uh, first time through, it's going to be tough to get through because they're wrought with emotion, their own emotions. Uh, and then when they describe Kate's emotions and once she saw the body, how she was overcome with grief and the tears. And then finally she gathered yeah. herself. And, you know, she couldn't bring herself to say goodbye. You know, she just couldn't believe that this was it. And uh, everything was there for her. And we talked about her getting knocked down. Can you imagine everything she went through to that point in her life? But yeah. now it looks like, boy, I've met this soldier. I mean, there's no arguing. Handsome, you know, and uh, major he's, general. He's a yeah. major general. And I mean, gee whiz. And then you pull the carpet out from under her feet. And oh, my goodness. Yeah, so um, so we do have those letters. I quote from them, reference them. Franklin and Marshall is a treasure trove. Anybody's researching anything to do with John Reynolds probably already knows this, but if you don't out there in, in uh, internet world, YouTube world, go there. 
Uh, Christopher Robb is an amazing um, archivist librarian. Everything I asked of him and more. And believe me, I've got him pulling letters out that aren't listed that I know are there because I'm looking at what Ed Nichols had to say. And yeah. then I go back to Chris and I say, Chris, what about the Nichols papers? Because I thought they might be at Penn State. Nichols was a professor at Penn State. But his papers about the book, they're at Franklin and Marshall. Okay. So, excuse me. So, anyway, there's tons there. Tons there. Absolutely. And uh, and a lot of that, I'll go back to Mike Riley. He was one of the first to look at a lot of that stuff, Jim. Um, lock of hair. He said he opened an envelope over there. And all these little things fell out and his hair fell out. And it's a lock of Reynolds hair that they have. Yeah. They didn't even know they had. This is going back years, you know. Yeah. So when Mike was first over there doing some research, but of course it's very well organized now. And that's a credit to the family too, because the family made sure it's there. And there's another branch of the family that donates, aside from the branch that donated most of that stuff. And that's the John Fulton Reynolds Scott family. Scott the second, the third. I dealt with the third and his sisters, Mary and uh, Carol. Fantastic. There's also Katie Cleaver. She's descended from Lydia Reynolds. Mm. Okay. And Lydia Reynolds uh, had um, very close with her, her brother, William. And so this family was extremely knowledgeable about William Reynolds and anything he wrote, his logs from that famous expedition I talked about earlier. And that's controversial because there's almost a mutiny on that thing, the Wilkes expedition. Wilkes is an interesting character, as you probably know. But anyway, um, all those papers are there too. Family donated those. Oh. So, man, yeah, it's amazing. And by the way, Philbrick put a plug in here because he was kind enough to write back to me, send him a copy of the book. I thought he might be interested. Have you heard of Sea of Glory? Um, I'm not familiar with that book, but I know of Mr. Philbrick's many other works. Other ones. Well, this yeah. is the expedition I've been talking to you about. Yeah, yeah. Largely based upon William Reynolds. Um, uh, journal he was supposed to keep one for the ship an official one that uh wilkes was gonna have but he kept one of his own too <laughs> and that's what this is so it's amazing yeah it, you know you mentioned the reynolds family you've mentioned the Vale family do you have any um connection with any of her descendants yeah that's really cool oh don't you wish um and i told you mary picking world class right i'll tell you mary Checked everything humanly possible to find this girl, Kate's parents. Yes. Kate names her parents twice at the Daughters of Charity, the paperwork. They still have the logs where, you know, there's the entries in there and her parents' name. Same thing at Eden Hall, Sacred Heart. Um, can't find them. So we suspect that uh, either um, they miss the senses coming and going um because if you move before they take it that year and you're late getting to where they've already taken it you could be missed yeah. um we think that's one possibility um but i'll tell you the big thing was this whole thing about kate is she from oswego owego that stems from the ways in the daughters of charity um documents and it's a little tough to make out so different researchers have interpreted it differently but kate mentions to the rental sisters when she's there to grieve that she had a brother. She's estranged from this brother. He's Baptist. He's not, not, they're not getting along. Who's the brother? <laughs> God bless Mary Pickton. She found a brother, Benjamin, Benjamin Hewitt. And we found more about him. I located a newspaper article that said that this Benjamin Hewitt from Owego had been to his sister's funeral in Albany is just back from it. And we found wow. documentation where she left him property. Kate left Benjamin property. So we have all kind of uh, ties. And right. the real interesting thing is Benjamin Hewitt um, had moved for, for a time from Owego to northern Pennsylvania. It's pretty close to the border, right, Owego? And at that time, there was a young lady who had uh, lived in Owego that moved down that way, too. We know this from the census records. Uh, they both come back about the same time. Well, that young lady ended up marrying this guy, Bruton, from out in California, his brother. That wedding was at the house where the brother lived in California. What? So this, yeah. yeah. So, so how does Kate Hewitt end up in California working as a governess? That's the nexus. Okay. Her brother and this young lady who married Bruton's brother, 
there's a connection there. So that's how Kate hears that they need someone to watch children. Gotcha. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The puzzle pieces are the fun part. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. When all these little pieces of the puzzle kind of start, start fitting together. So, yeah. Okay. So, so we've kind of, we've kind of touched on a lot of separate incidents here. Why don't we take it more as um, a timeline now? So she, she finds out he's dead. She meets the sisters. Obviously, he is ultimately buried in, in Lancaster. Um, do we have any indication? Does she go for those services? Or does she now then kind of stay in Philly? And why don't you pick up the story then of what she does after mm-hmm. his death? You know, and then we'll kind of talk more about the discovery and and, and things of that nature. But what does she do after, after he dies? Okay, so she's not at the funeral. Uh, and no one knows why. There's a mention in one of the letters where it sounds like she's planning to. It's a very small funeral, as you know. That's yeah. what Reynolds wanted. Yeah. Um, his staff's there, uh, every one of them. Um, but uh, no. And then the next time we find Kate Hewitt, other than the letter that's written, um, and uh, that comes from the archives at the Daughters of Charity originally, uh, that, that says basically we're looking to see if she can enter the process to become a sister. Um, and that's sent by someone at Eden Hall. <clears throat> she turns up in, in the postulancy, the period of trial period, basically. Is this life really for you? And that's the fall of 1863, in all likelihood, November, December time frame into January. And then finally, it's March, March 17, when she begins the formal process. Uh, and um, within months, she what's called receive the habit, you know, where they're going to wear what sisters wear. And she receives a name. That's one of the little mysteries that's never been cleared up. The family said they helped her pick this name. Um, but if you read what the Daughters of Charity have to say about it, no, she was given the name. Mm, so okay. S- Sister Hildegardus. Uh, Sister Hildegardus. So she and it just them rolls them. off the tongue, doesn't it? Oh, yes, it does. yeah. <laughs> So uh, she does her first mission in Emmitsburg and, uh, and then ultimately is moved up to um, Albany. Now, that's 1866, January of 1866. You read the letters from um, Ellie to Charles Vale, and she's telling them about this. So we can track it that way. And she's in Albany and looks like everything is okay. Um, And one of the things I'm proudest about of the book, Jim, and I encourage people, um, because not all publishers are willing to do this. And and, um, your colleague, uh, Britt, put me on to History Press. They're great Mm -hmm. about including photographs. And I mean, I've bombarded them. But some of these photographs that are in the book are, are truly meaningful. Um, but I was happy to be able to show where Kate lived in Albany as a member of the Daughters of Charity, where um, the church was that she served, and then ultimately other places she lived and, and back to the church for another reason we'll talk about shortly. But um, all these things, there's, there's a number of pictures in there. So she's in Albany. She's uh, with the Daughters of Charity. And um, that's take bring it through the summer of 1868. And then suddenly, as I mentioned, right before she's due to uh, to make or pronounce vows. She leaves. Now, um, Mary Latimer's book did a wonderful job on surfacing a document that indicated that she was asked to leave. OK, yeah. Now, this flies in the face of the way she had been received at Eden Hall. She has written about by um, the the officials from the school in an annual report at Eden Hall, what a wonderful person she is, how she can take every bit of energy energy she has and uh, and channel it in in the proper way, et cetera. They realized she hadn't been a Catholic, right? She's converting. So there's some roughness around the edges, but boy, they, they can't see enough about her in a positive sense. So here you fast forward 1868, she's committing her life to this and now, She's asked to leave, and you begin to wonder, what's up with this? And, and the statement was that she needed to rejoin her friends elsewhere, something to the effect that uh, her temper got the better of her. So you say, all right, could that be true? Who knows? Um, certainly, yeah. she's suffered in life. We talked about her ability to persevere, but at some point, you know, uh, this is going to get to you. She's sick. She's still suffering with the cough that won't seem to go away. It's mentioned any number of times in the letters that Ellie writes. So has she lost enough patience that she really shouldn't be there? We don't know. I like to look at another aspect of the story. Okay. Because the things that happen later 
lead me to believe that maybe there's something else at work here. Um, maybe I've seen one too many ministries, Jim. But she has come into contact with a gentleman named Joseph Fort, P-F-O-R-D-T. He's a florist in town. Florists and churches do a lot of business, right? She's going to see this individual, meet him, whatever, in all likelihood. Um, the lady that's the sister servant, in essence, and I hope I don't misspeak here, like a mother superior in school, yeah. sister servant is in charge of the sisters. Okay. She's the one that's asking Kate to leave. Within a year, this sister servant, sister Helen, whose name is Catherine Ryan, a lot of Kate's in the story, she <laughs> leaves. She leaves. And she and Kate Hewitt end up teaching school together in a private school. Now, back then, they called it a select school. Kate taught for a while herself. Kate Ryan, Sister Helen leaves. They teach together. Then Kate teaches on her own again. They even owned a property together for a while. Mm. What I wonder is, does Sister Helen see this young lady who's been through everything she's been through sees that she's met this other individual. Maybe this is a stretch. I don't know, but maybe she sees something and she said, Tate's not going to dishonor herself by leaving at this point, but she gets the nudge. She gets a strong nudge from sister Helen who sees what's happened and says, no, this girl deserves a chance at happiness. I'm asking her to leave. I don't know. Wow. It's all in my mind. Maybe. But you are you are a cockeyed optimist on that one, aren't you? <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, we know she met him because uh, it's it's a number of years later. But after teaching, and you can read any number of uh, newspapers where they're talking about her school, the announcement for students each year, Jim. But also great articles about the events that she would hold, where the kids are displaying um, arts embroidery that they've created that she's taught them mm -hmm. music they're playing she played music at eden hall we have the records she paid extra money while there to have access to a piano to, to play piano anyway all of a sudden those articles stopped mm. and that's why i think everybody thought she disappeared what happened what happened well there's no more kate hewitt to find in the newspaper <laughs> but there's a Catherine Fort to find in the newspaper <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to go to commercial and be right back. <laughs> now I'm teasing. I don't know. Yeah, you hold on. You got the, show, you got the viewers on the edge of their YouTube seats at this point. So. <laughs> and does she get a happy ending? How does the <laughs> does marriage with Mr. Ending? Fort turn out? Yeah. So, um, yeah, here's the beauty of it. And this goes back to the genealogy work. Some okay. of the tools we use, and, and you mentioned like somewhere along the line to me, Jim, like how did we find all this stuff out, right? So we're scouring mm -hmm. these newspaper databases, genealogy stuff, any documentation, city directories, you name it, uh, speaking to different repositories. But online on a genealogy that had been posted by a lady named Liz Warner was a family Bible. In that family Bible, it showed a marriage of Catherine Hewitt to Joseph Ford, to Joseph Ford, June 24th, 1874, in Albany, New York, at St. Joseph's. And in the write-up that this lady had included in the genealogy, she mentions that this Catherine Hewitt had once been a sister with the Daughters of Charity. Wow. That's one of those moments where Mary and oh, I are like, knock us over with a feather, you know, holy yeah. smoke, here it is. Here it is after all these years. And, you know, Wayne wanted to know, Mike wanted to know, all the research. I don't know why the good Lord took me down this road. I'm just so happy to be able to get there, Jim. Colonel Sheeds, I mean, you talk about guiding royalty, right? He always wanted to know. And Wayne wrote about this. He was kind enough, Wayne, to write the Ford. And this is what drove Wayne to find it for all these years. So I'm sharing this. God bless Wayne. Wayne could hold a clearance. I'll tell you that. It was everything I told him that we found that I told him, don't tell anybody. He didn't tell us all. Yeah, no, Did he, he didn't. Did he I, can, I, <laughs> okay. I can attest that he, he teased me with things are coming out, Jim, but no, he didn't, he didn't tell me didn't anything tell. other yeah, well, he did. nothing. Other than that. Right. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, <laughs> no, he was very good about that. But uh, 
you know, um, it was it was something. And, and so Liz was kind enough in the book. You'll see a picture of the family Bible, the page where he says this. Um, but that's what put us on to us. Then, Jim, we're finding newspaper articles about the wedding. And um, fortunately, so many great people in Albany that helped me. I won't get into name and names up there. They know who they are. They're in the announcements. Couldn't have done it without them. Mm -hmm. One lady in particular went into the archives. St. Joseph's is no longer an active church. It was absorbed into the Sacred Heart. But okay. the Sacred Heart archives hold St. Joseph's up in Albany, um, all the materials. They pull out the original wedding certificate for Kate Hewitt. And it's got her maiden name on it, Kate Hewitt and Joseph Jeez. Ford. And there's Latin on there. It's got the pastor's name. It's everything. And um, I was just so happy to be able to tie things together with yeah. every bit of evidence we could find. And uh, and then ultimately, the toughest evidence that we had to deal with is, is in terms of coming to, you know, dealing with it from the heart is knowing that she only lived two more years. Okay. October 6, 1876, she finally succumbed, succumbed to the illness that had haunted her for years, um, tuberculosis, consumption, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's what's on in the cemetery internment book as a cause of death. Now, we know she was buried in the family plot, the Fort family plot. There is no stone for her to identify her grave. Okay. And that bothered us for a couple of reasons, but we want to make sure she's there. We want to know that, you know, we're doing our research right. So I went back to the lot purchase. Bless these people, too, that are up there doing this kind of Troy genealogy research and Irish genealogy, what have you. They've got everything now transcribed. And in the lot purchase portion of the book for the Fort family, that lot was purchased on October 7th, 1876. You don't mm -hmm. buy a lot for no reason. I mean, some people buy them early and what have you, but you're buying that the day after she died. She's in that lot, you know. So we decided to raise some money to put a new stone there for her, which I know you're aware of, Jim. And bless everybody that contributed to it. And we placed it during COVID, and then we had a formal dedication. I can tell you about it in a few minutes uh, later on. Um, and I want to tell you about that because it was a really special day. But um, she's buried in the same cemetery, St. Agnes, where many of the sisters who had served the Daughters of Charity are also buried. And so um, she's buried there the following day, the eighth. Articles in the newspaper all about her religious uh, ways, her commitment to religion, the fact that she's been a sister, et cetera. So it's all tied together there. Right, okay. So to, to me, it's irrefutable evidence. This is Kate Hewitt. You can go online. You'll see other things out there. You, you even see that some other graves identified. And some you can't correct the Internet, right? Oh, but of course we not. Do, <laughs> we do have the information there out on uh, Find a Grave uh, for St. Agnes and Kate's grave. Okay. You know, we didn't touch on her age that much. How old was she been when she died? Yeah, she's um, 40. 40. And uh, yeah, so when when John's killed, he's 42, she's right. 27. Right. You know, significantly younger. And and you talk about how you present this, as I always do that too on the tour. I said, so, you know, there's a huge age difference. Not a big deal back then, right? Yeah. Not a huge deal at all. It's not that bad. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, the significant age difference there. I mean, it's interesting. He lived to 42, right? And of course, she mm -hmm. lives to 40. So yeah. neither of them got much. They always talk about Elvis always only <laughs> making it to 42, right? I know you use that theme music sometimes, Jim, right? At the beginning of your show, the Elvis, the uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. I've heard that before. Yeah. For us, yeah. it's more of the Ric Flair entrance music, oh, but it's the Rick same Flair. thing. Right? Some, some of you, some of you highbrows might know it is 2001, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't know whether to put the Elvis jumpsuit on tonight or not. So you good, always good. Good. I, I got no Ric Flair for you. I'm sorry. It's, those days are gone. <laughs> I yeah, got the extra things from the... <laughs> need to let the hair grow out a little bit if you Yes, Ric exactly. Flair, so. <laughs> exactly. Too so funny. they're only married two years. She's 40 years old. I'm presuming no children. Um, right. did he have any other offspring, maybe from a prior or later relationship? Were a lot of people at the funeral? I'm trying to get a sense. Did Kate kind of at least go out with maybe a big extended family or were they small group? Yeah. What do we know? So glad you asked because uh Liz Warner. 
Liz Warner is the, get this, great-granddaughter. That's it. Not great-great. She's the great-granddaughter of Joseph Fort's second wife. Okay. He only married twice, and they have children, and she's de- descended from one of those children. So that's how she gets the family Bible. So you're right. Kate and Joseph, no children. This, the, uh, according to the article I have from the newspaper up there, I think it's the Albany Argus, uh, some of the um, funeral was well attended. Very okay. well attended. Oh, good. So, good. Uh, good. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Now, probably the greatest tribute to Kate, and we touched on this earlier, and I know I've brought up embroidery a couple of times, but the interesting thing to me, in doing a, once we got a name, right? Mm-hmm. So you're searching Kate Hewitt, Kate Hewitt, Kate Hewitt. Now you're searching Catherine Ford. Yeah. Right. And I come upon a website called Hoxie, H-O-X-I-E. And this is a history guy from Albany who writes some really interesting things. Well, there's a post on there about the incredible embroidery of Catherine Fort. No kidding. He has no idea who Catherine right. Hewitt is. He's writing about Catherine Fort. This, and I'll tell you what I had no idea about, Catherine Fort is famous for her embroidery in Albany. Uh, she does it for a number of like what we would call craft fairs and that kind of thing, but it builds. She does one for St. John the Baptist Society, huge mm. banner, like five by nine, something huge. But she becomes so well known for this thing, Jim, that when the <laughs> centennial, right, this is, this is unreal. 18, um, 1876, centennial. Yeah. Celebration of the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. There's a women's pavilion. This is unheard of. On her, you know, they say about a quarter of the population of the country that of the time at that time attended the centennial exhibition. So anyway, Kate Hewitt is commissioned in essence, although she pays for the materials, as I understand it, from what I've read, to create a banner on behalf of the state of New York to Jeez. display in the women's pavilion. Oh, wow, this thing, this thing is the star of the show. This is remarkable. Any number of newspaper articles out there about it. And this guy mentions them in, in his article on Hoxie. But the most powerful one is written by a guy from the Chicago Tribune who says there's two things to see. And he never goes into what the second, I don't think. But he talks all about her banner and how incredible. Seal of the United States and a pyramid on the other side and the colors and the vibrancy. And so now I got another project. I'm researching far and wide trying to find an image of this thing. Yeah, and there yeah, aren't all that many that. images of the women's pavilion inside, and okay. we could never find. We found one of a banner of all things. It's not her banner. It's not unfortunately, that um, but they give awards for the centennial on the day Catherine Hewitt dies. An award comes out in her name. Oh, her stop. banner. No, no, stop. Are stop. you kidding now me? Now you're getting oh. hair up on your neck. And yeah. That's that's just wrong. You know, I mean this no. Rocky Bal- this Rocky Balboa story yes. that you told us tonight, the woman who just keeps getting knocked down and finally she gets her big award on the day she dies. Oh, that's sad. That's she dies. Sad. Yeah. I oh, wonder if she yeah. even if they even, you know, it's announced that day. Does the word get out by wire? Right. Is, she, is she even told? Is she aware? I don't know. But it's it's really it's a cruel irony. Yeah, but um, it is um, certainly a tribute to her. I think um, the fact that she was that artistic, that creative, it just goes hand in glove with everything you want to say about her. And I think when you look back at Kate Hewitt, you have to marvel at uh, her perseverance and uh, finding yeah. a way to to uh, you know and that old expression: "You're going to make lemonade out of lemons." I mean, I like to say it's triumph over adversity, and she embodies that. Yeah, she sure does. Do we yeah. have do we have any later later period photos of her? Do we know how uh, she turned out? I mean, uh, there's that geez. one we always see. Yeah, and it's too good. funny. Yeah, I got to say, um, I'm so glad you're hitting on some of these things because I, I made some notes today. I was like, oh, I want to make sure I mention this. So the cover of the book. May I? Yes, please. Yeah, not too much, but anyway. That image right there, Kate. Pull, pull it back a little bit from the camera. Pull back. Okay. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Right there. Right about. And little, there's John right yeah. under. Yeah. Perfect. There you go. Perfect. All right. Comes to me from the good graces of um, Katie Cleaver, who's descended from Lydia Reynolds. No one had ever seen that image. Talk about knocking me over with a feather. 
the book's about ready to go to press. The cover's <laughs> been kind of looked at and designed. This thing comes to me. Holy smoke. There's two pictures of Kay Hewitt out there prior to yeah. this. One, yeah. she's fairly young. One, she's older. Um, and I will drop a name. Um, uh, darn it. If I'm going to drop a name, I should remember the name. <laughs> that helps. Well, I know Elizabeth Topping. Um, what is um, Military Images Magazine, Coddington? Ron, Ron. Ron, Ron, Sorry, Ron, Ron. Coddington, yeah. Ron. Maybe when in doubt on this me. show, go with Ric Flair if you can't think Rick of it. Ric Flair, Rick, Ron. Ron right. Coddington. Tomato, tomato. Hmm. Um, so I'm looking at these images of Kate Hewitt that we knew about, the two, and I'm trying to date these things. And the information that's on the back of them seems to conflict with what you might think. And when were they taken? Everybody believed these things were taken in Philadelphia, blah, blah, blah. I'm looking at mm -hmm. these things. So I turned to Ron and I said, Ron, I need some help here. And so these are experts. And he brings in Elizabeth Topping, who knows um, what women are wearing and can help date things that way. Bottom line is, um, we came up with a pretty good feel for when those photos were taken, those images, excuse me. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and they were recreated in Philadelphia. Those are recreations of, of the originals, we feel, at least they feel, I should say. And uh, the way they explained it to me made perfect sense. So we have the estimations of the dates. Now, the interesting thing is they bookend, if you will, the previously unknown photo that surfaced right before oh, the book wow. went to publication. Wow. And that is one wild picture, the headwear she's wearing and what have you. But that picture shows her as she likely would have appeared at the time John met her. Yeah. And that's why I wanted it on the cover. I got you. And the picture of John in civilian dress, that's in Utah. Uh, that's the second time he goes out on a West uh, trip and uh, he's, he's taken a photograph there, uh, an image in, in civilian. I felt that fit mm -hmm. best with that. So that's why they're there. Um, so you have those two images of her. Now, the other thing that goes in and, and to me, the headlines on the book are, we know what happened to Kate, mm -hmm. uh, you know? Yeah. She left it all as a charity. Wasn't her choice. She taught but she met someone, fell in love, got married, and lived far too too short of a life after that. Um, we know what happened now in California. Uh, is it shocking? Yes. Can we make sense of it? Of course. Yeah. Um, but but the other story, uh, aside from all these things I've mentioned, uh, there's little things, there's big things. John Reynolds' ring. No one had ever seen John Reynolds' ring. The family's kind enough to have me be able to go to Dale Gallen and say, here's what the ring looks like. Can you do an artist impression? So it's in the book. We now know what John Reynolds, and they're one-offs back then, Jim, you probably know that the guys designed their own rings back there in essence. Yeah. It's right. wasn't a class ring for, you know, class 42, 41, 45, whatever. Everybody's got different rings within any given class, but there's some images that came to the fore a number of years ago um, of uh, the Reynolds family on the battlefield. Now, this is November of 1863. They're over around the slaughter pen and the devil's den. Mm -hmm. And at first, no one realized it was the Reynolds family. Right. But then that came about, and this is some, of course, Frazzanito's great work, Tim Smith and what have you. Um, fortunately, the family had this image as well. Not only uh, both these images, but also a beautiful etching that uh, I mentioned Katie Cleaver. Katie Cleaver's mom was really the historian in the family, also an incredible artist. And uh, that's a common denominator in the story, but she had beautiful etching of the scene of the family over in a slaughter pit. So I'm getting this stuff from the family and I'm looking at these pictures and I've got pictures of some of John's sisters. And I'm looking at, okay, that's, that's Catherine. Not Kate, right? That's Catherine Reynolds. Uh, this is Lydia, et cetera. Who's this woman in the middle? Wait a minute. Let's go back to these two pictures of Kate Hewitt. Right. And I'm realizing this looks an awful lot like Kate Hewitt. Well, this is a slaughter pit. So now I get the picture of them standing in front of a huge boulder or uh, devil's den. At the bottom of the picture, now this is contemporary, but it's yeah. all labeled. Who's in the picture? And sure enough, Kate Hewitt's identified in yeah, there. Yeah. So you got the photo analysis going on. You got the contemporary evidence. But I'll tell you something. Hear it here first. And it depends on how soon you get this aired. I won't tell it for a while. And this is my own bad, and maybe other people have noticed this. But I'm looking at Kate in the picture in the slaughter pen a few days ago. 
And I saw something I hadn't even, I'm concentrating on the faces. She's the only one in that picture holding something in her hands. Have any idea what she might be holding? I'm no, I don't. I'm not going to say a baby basket or something. A baby <laughs> Don't. Now you're telling your stories on the field again. Right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a book. And okay. you can't read it, but you can see there's some writing on the front of the book. Now, is it the Holy Bible? This is the time when she would have been going through her postulancy. Yeah, She's sure. She's going to be going there. Is it one of the books from the Daughters of Jack? I don't know, but it's real interesting to me. If you look at that image, she's holding the book. Well, I'll have and to go back and check that out again. Yeah, Check yeah. it out. Yeah, That's check it out. But so we got, uh, went into some research to determine when the family's there, both visits. But uh, we know now, I firmly believe that Kate's with them there. Makes perfect sense. And um, she's there. Then the second visit, when they come back to following late winter, early spring, that's when she's already down at the Daughters of Charity and they go visit her. Okay. And I and think Charles talk- Vale's with them. He's showing them where he's killed. You know, they got the yeah, tree yeah. where the R is in it. Tyson well, photos in the book, Sue Boardman. Thank you, Sue. Well, you, t- you touched on it a little bit, but then just to kind of add it to our chronology here, at what point then does she stop contacting the Reynoldses and the Charles Vales of the world? At what point, when do they lose, sort of lose touch? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and the sisters write to Vail for years and years. But from <laughs> the last letter that they mention her is August. I believe it's August of 1868. She 68. leaves after that. And then you don't hear anything else about her. You no know, okay. letters talking about Kate. So um, because that kind of can play into, OK, well, what were they really thinking? And maybe if Ellie did destroy the letters, why? Was it because Kate left? Because at this time, Ellie probably has no idea that maybe Kate's met someone and maybe she hadn't even really gotten to know Joseph at that point that well. Maybe she yeah. saw him coming and going. Yeah. So, you know, we don't know. Okay. Just, that's, it's always killing me about these letters. But yeah, that's the last time they're okay. talking about Kate. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's kind of sad, really, when you think about it. Yeah, it is. I mean, whether or not they ever knew how she ended up or what happened, I guess at least for now, we'll never know. But like you said, letters, newspaper accounts, something turns up all the time these days. And that's why so many great yeah. Gettysburg books keep coming out because we keep finding more stuff. New and, things. And these opened up archives. Well, yeah, I, exactly right. I think we hit almost everything I had on my bucket list here. Jeff, is there anything you wanted to talk about that I didn't cover? I'm sure there'll be like 10 things when we're done. But let me... Let me close with this one. Um, I got a call um, from Rosemary Nichols of the uh, Capital District Civil War Roundtable. Oh, sure. Um, Okay. Yeah. uh, Last year, last summer. And she wanted to hold an event to formally dedicate to Stone for Kate that we didn't get a chance to do during COVID. And of course, I'm all in. Yeah. Never been to Albany. But yeah, let's go. And so let's do this. And uh, Matt George is involved. You know, great guy. You know, Matt up there. But um, we go, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day. I mean, it's one of those days that you just dream of with the blue sky. It, mm. It's in the fall. It's October, mm, yeah. and the trees are just spectacular at that time. And um, I've invited uh, both sides of the Reynolds family that I've been in touch with, and two representatives can come, one from each branch. They're there for this event. Now, we have some presentations in a big conference center up there, a uh, presentation on the Daughters of Charity and a presentation um, Wayne actually attended and he had some things to say. And I did one, of course, on Kate and John. Um, so, and we go to the cemetery over to St. Agnes. And I got to tell you, you know, there's some prayer said and what have you over to, yeah, um, yeah. to new, newly dedicated stone. But to see those two ladies who attended this, Descendants of John Reynolds sisters, great, great grand nieces who had never met, didn't even know about one another as far as I know. Thanks. And they get, they, this, it meant that much to them to come in the first place. But boy, if you could have seen them meet one another. Wow. And it's just wow. every ounce of energy you put into something like this right there, just like that, that's, that really brings meaning to it. Mm. So again, I don't, I, I lucked into it. 
Jim working on the other book and going down this road. So yeah. many blessings along the way with all the people that helped me, even on rentals, because I wanted to address things on rentals too, trying to tell sort of a parallel biography. And so I get into his Mexican war time and Good. all his civil war experience. And, and I mean, historians from every place helped me, you know, second Manassas guys like John Hennessy, mm -hmm. Bobby Crick, proud of all that, but just grateful grateful to these people because as you well know when you write a book man it's <laughs> it's not about you it's the story yeah that's right but it doesn't happen without that amazing cast of people that come to you that answer the phone call that answer the email and are willing mm -hmm. to go uh, the extra mile so i thank all of them out there and i thank people like you jim and uh your amazing passion for all things gettysburg and history and uh, things i've been involved with and all the things that you're involved with sharing with people, man, we all owe you a debt of gratitude. No. And I mean, thank you for, uh, you know, not only taking the time to come out here tonight, but for putting all the pieces together on this Reynolds puzzle that have, that have had so many people perplexed for, for so long. And, you know, the old saying success has many authors. There's a lot of people who helped you, but ultimately you're the guy who put it all together. So Congrats on that. And congrats on the success of the book. I have a copy. If you at home don't have a copy, Jeff, you want to hold that up one more time here? Give everybody. Yeah, sure. Back? Yeah. Wherever books are sold. Wherever fine uh, books are sold. Uh, sold. Yeah. Get it's just better first. than this. There you Lost. Go. <laughs> that's perfect. Covers there up you your, your face too. So that's it's, really perfect. That's exactly. It's perfect. Um, Gettysburg's yeah. so Lost online Love anywhere. Story. And, um, Stores in town in Gettysburg, certainly the gift stores, the bookstores, the museums, all of them. So, yeah, thank everybody for getting the story out there. And, um, yeah, and thank yeah. you, Jim. Yeah, it's an well, honor. we'll have you back again to talk about some of the other work you're doing. But uh really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us tonight here on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast on YouTube. So, folks, this is I'm Jim Hessler. This has been Jeff Harding. And we thank you all for uh watching and listening.